Rock and roll. Welcome to Tough Talks, Mary. Thank you. Excited to chat. So Tough Talks, it's an interview series where we ask smart people, in this case, you, tough questions. <laughs> tough questions about how to have a career path and growth. Um, tough questions about what it's like working at a small business or a company that's growing really quickly. And tough questions about personal growth. More than advice, it's more kind of information sharing and learnings that you've experienced along the way. And today we're pumped to have you with us. <laughs> I'm excited too. I think like we'll dive into it more, but there's lots of reasons that I maybe have a unique perspective and you have a unique perspective on both of our career paths. So we're going to dive right in with something very, very specific. Um, about a month ago, you posted on LinkedIn yes. and it went viral or viral in my standards over a thousand, for me. <laughs> yeah, thousands of likes, lots of comments. And um, I'll just read the first couple sentences of this, but it definitely feels like a topic that maybe was more personal to you um, or maybe was intimidated not to put words in your mouth, but intimidating to share. And essentially you said, I started ahead of people role in March and turned in my resignation in August. Working in recruiting, I get the double-sided question from candidates and hiring managers all the time. Should I be concerned about a six-month tenure? And I would really love to know what what do you think it is about this particular post? And obviously, you go into more detail here, but why did, why do you think this resonated with people? I think it resonated with people for a few reasons. One, I think um, generally I try to like use first person a lot on LinkedIn and share just kind of like my story and my experience versus generalizing. Um, so like, instead of posting something like, should you leave your role after six months? I made it about me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that resonates because it's just a little bit more personal. So like, there's lots of people on LinkedIn I'm connected with who don't know me, but there's also lots of people on LinkedIn who do know me. And so I think having that like a little bit of vulnerability maybe resonated with people. Um, and then I also think it was just a little bit timely too. Um, I work in recruiting and talent. And so I think about it all the time, but um, there's just so many articles out there right now about like, should I leave my job? Or like, what if I've only been at my job for four months? Is it okay to leave? Um, and so I think just like the topic is being seen a lot. So it was a little bit more of like a real life example. And then I also think too, like, the more age old advice has been, if you're at a company and you are unhappy, you should at least stay for one year. Um, and I'm kind of um, taking the other side of that argument. So maybe that resonated with people too, because it's not the anecdote that's told as often. I think building on that. So you're now head of talent at Alpha. And I read, you recently quoted a team member that said, life is too short to stay in unhealthy jobs. And on paper, that feels really obvious and kind of connected to what you posted on LinkedIn. Um, but clearly it's not. If it's invoking conversation and it feels like it's resonating with people, maybe it's not that obvious or not that easy to make that decision. And I was curious from your perspective, like what's up with that? Like, what have you seen or, or why do people stay in jobs that they don't enjoy um, or aren't happy with? Yes, that's a great question. One clarification I'll make real quick is the quote was from someone in the alpha community. So not a deep member, but someone who uh, is like an alpha member. Mm -hmm. And that's how we create a lot of our content is like community sourced content. Um, but to answer your actual question, I think it's probably nuanced. Um, I think like privilege is a piece of it. I am fortunate that I can just decide to change jobs and financially um, I can make that decision without worrying about supporting a family or a partner. Um, so I think that's one piece that like, when I do share the thought that like, if you're unhappy in a role, you should change, I always try to add that caveat of like, not everyone can, and you shouldn't feel bad if you can't. Right. Um, but then I also think that I think 
personally, like my personality trait, I don't think, I don't like look forward a lot and I don't look back a lot. And I mean that just in terms of, um, I don't do ask myself a lot of what ifs. And that doesn't mean that's like the best way to do things. Certainly I've made mistakes by thinking that way, but I think that frame work and mindset also helps um, me like jump into changes a little bit easier than it might be for other people. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying instead of like, what if always thinks of something like, uh, what if I took that path and not this path? So do you think by not asking those questions, you're allowed to make a decision in the moment versus all the other scenarios that could be lingering? Yeah. And I think the phrase I hear a lot too from people thinking about career change, like if they're unhappy in their role, like that phrase I hear a lot is um, the devil, you know, is better than the devil you don't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I think that's another, um, maybe like mental block that gets used sometimes of like, I'm not happy in my job now, but like, there's no guarantees I'll be happy in that job. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's something that comes up a lot too. Mm. Grass isn't always greener. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the post resonated with people? Um, I think for a lot of what you've articulated, I mean, I think um, you you stated because it's a little bit more personal. And I do think that you can't, there's not always opportunities to be as personal on a channel LinkedIn, like LinkedIn, but I do think that when it feels relevant and helpful and valuable to people who might be feeling something similar, then it it really strikes a chord. Um, I also think given your position, you know, be like, it would be one thing to hear it from somebody who's a growth marketer or a PPC specialist, but you spend so much time collaborating so closely with candidates and helping them think mm-hmm. through these decisions. And so being in it yourself, like actually now all of this advice that maybe or or conversations you've had with other people to help them arrive at the right decision for them, it's like now it was your turn to be in the driver's mm-hmm. seat. And I think there's something really unique about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Alpha, mm-hmm. I was reading, um, you sent out an email the other day and yes. the, the headlines stood out to me. So red red flags for women at work. And there's kind that of- That was actually inspired by Tough. Um, you all had either a post or a newsletter capitalizing on the red flag trend that was going on. <laughs> I didn't know that, but <laughs> I'm glad we could. I'm glad we could be a source of inspiration. But um, no, when I read that red flags for women at work, um, I guess my question to you is: Do you think women have more red flags to look out for, or just specific ones? I think. <laughs> I think everyone who is underrepresented in tech has red flags to look out for. And I think um, it's like intersectional, like I can speak from the place of being a straight white woman, some flags that I might look out for. Um, Mm -hmm. But I do think that I think yes. I think like generally there's red flags everyone might see at a company and be like, no, no, no. But then there are some tailored to um, women. And I think the reason I'm struggling to articulate this is because it's easier for me to think of like signals of inclusion at a company. Um, yeah. The more positive side versus focusing on kind of like yeah. things. To so I was looking for things like parental leave policy and what is the time for that and what are the flexible work hours and is the company open to remote work? Um, Things that kind of show the company's being thoughtful about um, how they run their company. And it doesn't even mean like, I might not even, like maternity leave might never be relevant to me, but it still can serve as a signal of this company is thinking about this thing. And I think when they, when a company can show that it's thinking about some of the groups who have historically been underrepresented in tech, then um, it creates, it kind of like raises the tide for everyone and creates a better place, um, whether you identify as like a majority group. Um, Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. I think that they're really strong signals if they apply to you or don't. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the like stronger signals that you think women can look out for? Yeah, I think some that I personally have found to be the most meaningful in my own um, kind of like career journey has been if the founders and I, my background specifically in like startup and tech. So if the founders of a company have their own connection to diversity and inclusion or their own story to tell about why they care about it, mm -hmm. um, I think is really helpful. I think that's like one of the foundations for a company having a like meaningful approach to diversity and inclusion. And so depending on the size of a company, you may have the chance to have that conversation in the interview process or not. Um, but I, I think that is really helpful. Um, I think a company having explicit documentation and documentation can be like a Word doc or a page of Notion or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't have to be super formal, but just has taken the time to write down their approaches to things like vacation and flexible work and um, just generally like how we communicate at our company. Um, I think that's really a positive signal because it shows that A, they've thought about it, but then also they've taken the time to write it down. Um, and then I think to, I think this, this question, this framing, I think is different, um, like post pandemic, but even hmm. before COVID, um, I would say like a company that has put in infrastructure for team team members to work remotely. And so mm -hmm. have an office, but I think that um, wanting to attract talent from different places um, that's more in line with maybe like what you're building or the community you're sort of serving um, is also an important factor. Speaking of places, mm -hmm. So you've experienced career building in both like big, busy city of San Francisco, and now you're in Boise, which is maybe a quieter, or more mountain town. Um, how do those two compare? Yeah. I think in my day to day, there's not too big of a difference. And I think I'm unique because I've worked mostly in remote teams. So even when I worked, um, when I first moved to San Francisco, I was at Buffer and Buffer's all over the world. And so um, it didn't change too much in my day-to-day -day work. But one thing that was cool about Bigger City, um, especially at that time, was more opportunities to like learn. Like there, like in San Francisco or other larger cities, there were just more like uh, meetups for people working in people ops or meetups for people working in recruiting. Um, and so I think that definitely was more present back in 2013 <laughs> in San Francisco. And I think now that people are working remotely more um, and people are a lot more comfortable like building community and building relationships over Zoom. I think that doesn't apply as much today as it might. Um, <laughs> But I think because I've always worked on remote teams or teams that are distributed and not like solely based out of San Francisco, I wouldn't say it's changed too much. Um, I think being in San Francisco as a city has probably shaped um, my like view of the world and, and um, what I think inclusion looks like. Um, but mm -hmm. like the Mountain West also it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite coffee shop in Boise? <laughs> My favorite coffee shop in Boise is Push and Pour. Um, they have two locations and they do a lot of um, like community building um, and featuring local artists. And um, I think they do a good job creating like a strong vibe. <laughs> the right speaking, <laughs> speaking of vibes i was scrolling through your instagram and i saw this post from 2016 man a long time ago um it's obviously a very tasty s'more what is your how do you, do you perfect like what's your s'more recipe what's your go-to is it just like the original ingredients or do you do like candy how do you make in your opinion what's a perfect s'more 
Yes. Um, my perfect s'more is graham cracker and Reese's and marshmallow. So you toast the marshmallow like just past golden brown. <laughs> and then it you put it on and melts the Reese's in the graham cracker. Do you ever do them at home or is it like camping only? Camping only. I actually like every time I sit down at a fire and people are making s'mores, I'm usually like, mm, I don't want one. I don't like s'mores, but then it looks so fun and I make one and then I'm like, oh, I do like s'mores. <laughs> Getting it perfect so that the marshmallow doesn't fall off the s'more stick though is like such a challenge, I find. What is your favorite s'more? I think original, original, mm -hmm. but I want to like, I want, the, I don't want the marshmallow to be burnt, but I want it to be very gooey. And that's mm -hmm. why it's like, you have to like really invest in the slow rotation above the fire <laughs> for a very long time and be very patient and you can't rush it. Mm -hmm. You've, uh, you've talked about buffer, obviously, and then you've worked at, you know, on teams like Kip Camp and Tough and Next in the I'm curious, was there uh, like any defining moment that shifted your career towards people, ops, and talent? Mm -hmm. Yes. Chronologically, <laughs> the moment I would say <laughs> was at Buffer, but then I'll answer it in a, in a different way too. Um, I, back in 2013, I started working at Buffer and that was my first um, experience kind of working in tech. And I started on the customer support team. And I think that was really important because it like actively informs how I think about people ops and talent today. And the piece that informs it is at Buffer, I was working in support, but I worked really closely with product team. And so I was learning how to take in a lot of information, both like quantitative data and qualitative. So customers saying like, I'm so frustrated with this, this thing. And the muscle I think I was developing was understanding what people meant and like, what was at the root mm -hmm. cause? Like they might say something, but mean something else. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then turning all of that information into patterns and then turning those patterns into, okay, we've identified what it is now. Like what is our plan to make progress on this data point? Um, and so I think like, that's how I view people ops today is you're just kind of like internal customer support and learning mm -hmm. how to take all of the data that you're hearing from your team members and turning it into actionable product insights with the product being your culture. Um, but then like, uh, that was also the first time at Buffer that I started working in people ops. And so once the team was about 30, 35, um, we had the need for a full-time people ops and talent team member and I had been doing a lot of support for the support team hiring and onboarding and so it was kind of a natural transition to start doing that for the rest of the company um so that was really my first time really working in people ops I think that was 2015 is when I transitioned and that was really cool because I think um I didn't know it at the time but Buffer was pretty progressive, um, in yeah. especially at back in 2015, right. um, in terms of how they were building culture and thinking about things like compensation and what it looks like to be on a remote team. Um, and so that was a really cool foundation for my like start in people ops. I think it gave me a really high bar for like how invested founders should be in the people and culture on their team and that you can build a really successful company and focus on setting up every person on your team like setting them up for success will help you build a successful company mm -hmm. um, and so throughout the other companies that you listed including tough um i've continued to work in people ops and so um I think it's just kind of let me like continue to build that muscle I was talking about around like figuring out what is the pattern and problem and what do we need to do to continue building a good culture. But I think the turning point really was like having that opportunity to work in people ops for the first day. Hmm. I'm curious because I feel like at Tough we work with a lot of fast growing startups and and even thinking about our team resources even when you have funding and you are generating revenue and you are growing resources 
still are strapped. Mm -hmm. And so much, at least I find even in my role today is around prioritizing what I'm going to work on and what I'm going to help prioritize for the team and the, the company. Um, why, like, what advice, not advice, but like, why is it so important to spend time, even when you're a one or two person team, all the way up to a much larger team, like, why is it so important to spend time building on culture and benefits, even when you feel like maybe there's 10 other things like sales and HR and, and services and like all of the other things that might be on your plate as a founder, regardless of your team size, like, why is it so important to spend a, like concentrated effort on benefits and culture? Yes. I have a few answers going through my brain. I think the first one is maybe straightforward that like the earlier you put that kind of structure and foundation into your company, um, the larger the impact it'll have. So it's kind of like exponential in a way that the earlier you can have it, every new team member that joins um, is kind of like adopting that from the start versus like having to figure out that change later down the road. Mm -hmm. um, I think related, this framing is maybe a touch more relevant for software companies, um, but a way that I like to compare it is for early stage startups, um, there's a high level of comfort with like technical debt. And so it's um, making some kind of like trade-offs with your product that you're building, um, knowing that like, okay, this isn't like the best, um, most long-term way to solve this problem, but it'll work for now. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of speaks to like that prioritizing mindset that needs to happen. So maybe with agencies, it's like operational debt. Like you might put in something, you know, will work now, but it probably won't work later. Um, mm -hmm. And people debt, I think is a lot harder to pay back because it's people. Um, and so I think trying to get in the practice of not making those trade-offs of um, I'm going to focus on sales now. Um, or I'm going to focus on our marketing strategy now, um, trying to make just as much time thinking about your people and culture, um, because it really is almost like a full-time role. And I think a question I, that's related that I get a lot is like, when should I hire my first person to, um, focus on people ops or HR or talent? Um, and I think that answer generally depends on like how quickly your company's growing. Um, if you're growing slow, maybe there's a team member that can kind of hold a piece of that for a while. And if you're growing fast, you might need to hire that person earlier, but I have never talked to a company that has invested in that hire like too early. Um, it's always people being like, gosh, I wish I had hired this person earlier. Um, and then I think there's other, some other benefits. So I think there's big benefits to recruiting. Um, if you like so many candidates right now, um, can kind of take their pick where they want to work, especially like hiring right now for software engineers is a really big challenge. And I think if you can show that you have a thoughtful and mature recruiting process, um, mm -hmm. candidates really notice that. And, and it's again, a signal that you're, investing in the company that you're building and that your team recognizes that like people are a really important part of our company. And so we're going to create a great hiring process. Um, so I think it's those sort of like intangibles. And I think that's why it can sometimes be hard to invest time in people ops and recruiting early is because um, you don't have that like return on investment. That's really easy to understand like you do in other parts of business building. Um, so you kind of have to just trust, trust it or be like a second or third time founder who mm -hmm. maybe has learned the hard way or seen the benefits of it. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think the trust, it really resonates because as you were articulating a response, I, it seems like an intimate hire, um, you know, because I, I do think that that person has a lot to say about the culture and the experience that individuals have on the team. And mm -hmm. so it feels like a very intimate hire that you would have to have like extreme trust with that person because of the voice that they have in contributing to what the business and team culture will be, which is, you know, incredibly important. Yeah. I think too, that's probably why, um, founders sometimes hold on to the role 
longer than they should because it is so much work. Um, but it also does require a lot of a lot of like trust and being on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Um speaking of being on the same page, you helped build Tough. Um you were the second hire at Tough. Um if we're counting myself. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we're a growth marketing agency. We work with a lot of startups and I'm curious, I've, I got, I've never asked you this before, but is there anything you would do differently? Like anything, I know you talked about not asking the what, if, what ifs right in the beginning of this call, but is there anything that you would go back and do differently to set Tough Up for success based on what you know about our team today? Hmm. the easy answer is no I don't think so because I like an easy answer tough is in a really good place right now and it's been really cool to watch um obviously I don't have like the day-to-day -day perspective but from what I can see like it seems like every team member that joins tough like brings a lot to the culture and contributes a lot to the culture and so um, it feels really healthy in that way in terms of building a place where people can like really be themselves. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to change that for tough. Um, <laughs> but if I were to give you an answer, um, I think maybe <laughs> something that I've seen you personally grow into more is that just like trusting your gut more and trusting yourself to make decisions about like, okay, now it's time for us to make this hire. Or, um, I think we should say no to working with this company for this reason. And, um, maybe I would have changed like having us both work on developing that sooner. <laughs> mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, like, where I, I'm actively working on that is more, um, I do feel like I've always made my decisions based on like the information is like available as well as my gut. But as a first time founder, I like waited for that gut feeling to be like a smack in the head. Like yeah. it is like, it's so obvious at this point that I cannot make any other decision. And where we are now with Tough and my decision making, I've got to make that gut call when it's like a slight knock. Mm -hmm. like like it's there and i've got to do a better job listening to it early because it puts us in a position to make the confident decision early mm -hmm. versus making the confident decision when we're all kind of feeling a little like oh that's a week too late yeah and i think i'm i would imagine developing that comes with time but um maybe there are some things we could have done earlier too to um act on some of those things sooner my last question Spotify, you've got some big wild and the Beatles. Oh, this is my Spotify. <laughs> yeah, your Spotify. Okay, okay. Then of course we've got Billy. Uh -huh. um, I'm curious based on uh, St. Paul, uh, uh -huh. what is your? what do you think your musical taste says about your mood right now? Hmm. Joni Mitchell and Adele. <laughs> kind of have some like bluegrass slash pop, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I think it says about my mood right now that it has been kind of like fall, cold, rainy in Boise. Um, and so I think this is kind of like, I think the music I listen to is somewhat seasonal. Um, and I would say this is very much like a fall playlist to me. But then Adele is coming out with a new album. So I have been listening to Adele a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what's your favorite Billie Eilish song off her new album? um click on it <laughs> so obviously nothing stands out too much no i listened a lot to the album that like is corresponds with her um documentary mm. and my favorite one is i don't know bad guy's pretty good mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. or you've seen the I, don't, I don't know the names You've seen the <laughs> Melissa McCarthy bad guys video, right? I don't think so. You must find it. It's <laughs> oh. on YouTube and she remixes the exact video and it's the funniest thing. I'll go check it out. 
<laughs> Amazing. The, the, those were all the questions you had. Thanks for joining. Yes. Thank you, Ellen. Should we next it? Boop, boop. Snail. <laughs> <laughs>